Hi everybody, I'm Leslie Anderson from Ancestry and today's webinar is about uncovering your loyalist roots. Sometimes when we're researching our ancestors, we find ourselves in a time or place that isn't familiar. I had a will from my bound ancestors in England and in the 1780s, he listed his son William Bound had gone to North America. And I found through a hint on Ancestry, someone who had them in their tree living in Cape Breton Island. Because of the dates, I found myself having to learn about a very fascinating period of Canadian history, the American Revolution and the Loyalist. This presentation will hopefully give you tips on how to uncover your Loyalist roots and what records are available on Ancestry and beyond. It will be available for viewing afterwards, initially in the Ancestry CA feed, and then in the video's link. Also, we'll be opening up all of the Loyalist records on Ancestry that I will be showing you for 24 hours. So that's great news. So let me just flip my screen and we'll take a look. So let's start with a little bit of history. When American independence was officially recognized in April 1783, Americans who had remained loyal to the British Crown were persecuted and forced out of their home. The British government came to the aid of these loyalists and arranged for transportation to those who wished to leave. Many chose to settle in Nova Scotia, which then included New Brunswick, and in Quebec, which then included Ontario. Following the Constitutional Act of 1791, the colony of Quebec was divided to create Upper Canada, which is present-day Ontario, and Lower Canada, present-day Quebec. Military and civilian settlers submitted petitions to the governor to obtain crown lands, and sons and daughters of loyalists were also entitled to free lands. So what is a loyalist? A loyalist, in order to be one, had to have been either a male or female, as of the 19th of April, 1775, a resident of the American colonies, and have been loyal to the British Crown prior to the Treaty of Separation of 1783, and settled in a territory remaining under the rule of the Crown, or a soldier who served in an American Loyalist regiment and was disbanded in Canada, or a member of the Six Nations, either the Grand River or the Bay of Quinte Reserve, who is descended from one whose migration was similar to that of other Loyalists. However, there were others who qualified too. For example, if a Loyalist was killed in action, and his family then moved to Canada and settled around the time of the Treaty of Separation in 1783, they might qualify. At the same time, England offered a, temp a tempting refuge for Loyalists, any man or woman who could prove their support of the Crown during the war could move to Canada and receive a grant of 200 acres of land or more. And so more than a, there's varying sort of numbers, but more than 70,000 Loyalists did uh, flee the American colonies. And this included the list of people that I've got here, many Anglicans in the Northeast, uh, many Germans, uh, Pennsylvania, some Quakers, most of the Highland Scots in the South, and many of the Iroquois. Many people with close business connections to Britain who lived in coastal towns did remain loyal. And loyalists were most often people who were conservative by nature or in politics. They valued order or were fe fearful of mob rule, felt, felt sentimental ties to the mother country, were loyal to the king, or concerned that an independent new nation would not be able to defend themselves. Some escaped slaves became loyalists. They fought for the British, not out of real loyalty to the crown, but from a desire for freedom, which the British promised them in return for their military service. So my first tip is to research the right way, get a good guide. 
Research success means you'll need to have a general guide to assist the tracing of your loyalist ancestors. In this book, I like this book by Brenda Merriman, you'll find a guide to the necessary resources, background information, and the availability of records. Of course, the United Empire Loyalists Association of Canada's website has wonderful resources, including the Loyalist Directory, giving lots of case documentation, and an email contact of a knowledgeable individual for that particular loyalist or family. Ancestry has also put together a research guide, and I've personally written an article on Ancestry CA's blog on some of the resources that I used. Support for refugees, military service, and rewards for their loyalty creates a good paper trail with records in the United States, Canada, and England. Many of these have been digitized and indexed by Ancestry. Lists of loyalists have also been compiled and published as well. Records will include correspondence, land records, records of refugees, claims for lost property, and military records. Ancestry has put up about 25 or 30 collections related to the loyalists and put them on a special group page. And this is the, this is the URL for that particular page. It leads you to digitized records, some of them indexed, mostly military databases, and public, uh, published materials like books. So how do you find records on Ancestry? The best place, uh, one of the best places to go is the card catalog. And this is a listing of all of our databases where you can search by title or keyword. And you can see I've put it in here, the keyword is loyalist. And I have, have checked off display Canadian records only, but if you want to include other countries, you would uncheck that. You can also filter by collection here, um, by location, and also by dates. And so you might want to hit up, click on these headings in order to see what we have based on those dates. Another place to look is through our search tab right off the Ancestry CA page. So if you choose to uh, go all collections from this, it will be a global search, or you can go by category. And if you choose the military category, that's a great place to look for all of our military databases. If you click on military from the tab, it will take you to the military category page where you can fill in names in the fields, in the boxes there on the left-hand side, but also I'd like to call your attention to the right-hand side where our featured data collection are all of our Canadian military collections. And so if you choose that, you will get to all of our military collections going right back to the British Army in Canada in 1758. So the British government stationed British Army regiments in Canada for its defense from the close of the Seven Years' War, which ended in 1763, until 1861. Generally, these forces were garrisoned in fortifications such as those found in Quebec, Kingston, and Halifax. As well, a permanent fleet base was maintained in Halifax for the Royal Navy. The British Army and Royal Navy both included Loyalists among their ranks, in addition to serving alongside Loyalist units on almost a daily basis. But it is important for you to distinguish that the ancestors who eventually qualified for the UE after their names were not the regular soldiers who came from overseas under King George III. The first organized Loyalist unit permitted to fight in a serious battle of the Revolution was Alan McLean's 84th Regiment of Foot, also known as the Royal Highland Emigrants, who helped the British successfully defend Quebec after the American invasion of Canada in the last days of 1775. When I was preparing for this presentation, I thought I'd find the Loyalist regiments 
in this particular database, the WO or War Office 25, which was um, in the National Archives in Britain. And Ancestry digitized this uh, with the cooperation of Library and Archives Canada. And we did this to uh, uh, get all those really early records and the, the service files and the enlistments going back to the 1750s. Um, when I was preparing uh, for this presentation, I thought I'd find the Loyalist regiments in this database, but I was wrong because I thought they would be part of the British regimental registers. But as I said before, this is not the Loyalist uh, registers. And, but I'm mentioning them because they are so fabulous and they are really great records if you have Irish or if you have um, anybody that you're looking at early, early Canada, they probably uh, were stationed here with the British, uh, with the British, British regiments in Canada. So the database in this particular database continue, uh, includes statements of service, registers, returns, and other lists documenting the service of the soldiers and officers. And I just thought I'd give you an example here. And I know that some of you um, can find uh, mine blurry uh, or my examples or uh, it's, I can see it perfectly fine, so it must be the conversion, but I hope you can see these, but I'll talk you through them if you can't. But basically, you're going to get some really great information. You can get even the color of their hair and the color of their eyes through the service files of the, of the British Regimental Service. And it is such a very valuable database. And here's one of an officer and uh, I'm going to just point you down, it gives his information, but what I really liked in this bottom left-hand corner was it said exactly when he got married, his wife's name and his children's name and where they were born and the date they were born. So if you're lucky enough to have an ancestor or somebody who has this kind of a document, you will really luck out. Ancestry digitized the War Office 28 British Military Headquarters series from TNA and LAC. Volumes 2 to 10 include monthly returns and roles of many Northern Department Loyalist units. So this is where you can find Loyalist Provincial Regiments. So, for example, the Royal Highland Emigrants, which became part of that 84th, 1st Battalion, the King's Royal Regiment of New York. Uh, that goes from 1776 to 1783, butlers, rangers, etc. And this database contains images of letters, returns, and memorials from the field officers and the military departments in Canada, as well as general orders issued in Canada and the Nova Scotia commands. They can contain names, dates, locations, and other details and relate generally to the American Revolution, the War of 1812, and the early decades of the 19th century. Interesting for us today is to talk about the miscellaneous returns of loyalists. These are not indexed, so these records can be browsed by region and title. To find a loyalist regiment, you'll need to choose America, letters, returns, etc. And I've kind of blown it up there so you can see it. This is the different um, records that you can find for the various regiments and what volumes they're in. And so as you went down that list, uh, this I've just pulled the whole list out for you so that you can see the, the different areas as well. So we also have uh, from the, this particular collection of the headquarters, we have the miscellaneous returns from the volume 10, a list of loyalists here. And it is the, um, the loyalists of New York. And this just gives you an idea that you're gonna get a lot of names, you're gonna get some other information or very little information, but at least it is the original the original um, record that is often referred to in indexes and things like that. 
So this is the monthly return of the of the um, uh, the the people here of the loyalists and the dates that they just to show you the different types of records that we have. And uh, this is 1782 with names and dates of arrival and where they came from, uh, who brought them, the years of age and any remarks like he has a father in the king's works. I don't know if you can see that. I'll just see if I bumped it up. Um, the uh, Sorrel, it says, engaged as a blacksmith, has a son in the service, lame of hand. And here's a sad one here that his family were taken by the Indians in March last. So you're really getting some extra information, hopefully about your family, if you go and take a look at these innocuous monthly returns as well. Here's a list of prisoners with rebels said to be in New York or not known. So uh, you, could, you can uh, take a look at who they took as prisoners. And some of those prisoners, of course, joined the British side and, uh, and came to Canada. We also have the regimental service registers here. This shows the casualties for 1779. And on the other side, it shows William Bound was discharged in January. So uh, I, again, you can go through the list and, and hopefully your person is on it. I just thought I'd show you um, how to maybe navigate through uh, an unindexed record collection. And so many of these are referenced in indexes, and then you get to look at the, um, the, the information on Ancestry. And so if you go to the bottom of the image, you'll see the film strip icon and what image you're on out of how many images. And if you click on that film strip icon, you'll be able to clearly see what is a letter uh, maybe they're petitioning or they're writing back to the, to the uh, headquarters, but maybe there's a list. And so you'll be able to clearly see the list and then you can hone in on it as you go from image to image. So this is the Loyalists in the Southern Campaign of the Revolutionary War, Volumes 1 and 2. And this is a published book of material. It consists of the official roles of the Loyalists during the American Revolution who were recruited from North and South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Crowder's Early Ontario Settlers is a source book and compilation of a number of official documents which lists and provides some information about discharged British and German servicemen, American loyalists who served in the provincial regiments or who aided the British cause in various ways and some refugees. And so the government, the British government, provided the loyalists with rations on a reducing scale for three years for the whole family. You will find two provisioning lists, 1784 and 1786, listing the heads of those families and a census of sorts with their rations. So that's kind of neat. Now I thought I had found my bounds, but uh, I don't recognize any of these other Bowen or Bounds names in Kingston, unfortunately. Widows pension uh, applications or claims submitted by the widows of officers of the King's German Legion and American or British regiments who died in service or while on half pay. And files include copies of wills, birth certificates, and personal papers, etc. So this would only be relevant if the widow decided to reside in Canada after the Red Revolution but I'm including it on the theory that the records dating from this late uh, 18th century might include a treasure or two for you. Next is the Royal Navy. And the Royal Navy sought volunteers in every port they sailed into, not to mention impressing hundreds of civilians. They also uh, got merchant sailors, privateersmen, and even some provincial loyalist soldiers. These records are made up of pay lists, muster rolls for both ships and naval yards in Canada, 
and elsewhere, like the Cape of Good Hope, during an era when Great Britain was establishing itself as the dominant naval power in the world. Documents also include records relating to the War of 1812 and ships on the Great Lakes. Some documents might include birthplaces, qualities, which is the rank, and enlistment and discharge dates. They could also include tradesmen like these, smiths, sailmakers, and carpenters. You can find dates and places these records correspond to in the browse. Following the Revolutionary War, British commissioners were appointed to examine claims of losses sustained by the Loyalists in America during and following the war. Records in this database relate to Loyalist claims and the cases heard by Vess. So some Loyalists, particularly those who settled in the Maritime Provinces, submitted claims for losses. The claims contain details about former place of residence, property and details of military service and that kind of thing. Documents may, may, may mention names, residences, place and year, accounts of battles, estimates of losses, references to other documents presented in support of those claims, powers of attorney and other details, which will give you hopefully a, a picture of their life and the claim before and during that Revolutionary War. And these claims have been digitized and indexed by name on Ancestry. And so this audit office, uh, this is another record collection uh, from the archives, is really an audit, audit, audit office, or AO 12 and 13, is where you'll find the supporting documentation, documentation for a Loyalist ancestor. This is primary information and direct evidence of a Loyalist ancestor. Before Ancestry digitized it and indexed these claims, they were only accessible in an archives and it was a massive endeavor to consult them. So this is my John Bown of Flushing Long Island and he's claiming, you know, he's saying, look, I'm owed this amount of money because they came and took all the wood that I chopped. And so his claim is on the record now. This is a fantastic book by Peter Wilson Colham, containing summaries of some of these claims and the personal journals and the correspondence and recollections of those who lived through these times are especially significant. Of the 15,000 individuals recorded in his book, some three quarters took up residence outside of the United States after 1783, hence the title of his work. It really pays to read the footnotes. This was referenced in the footnotes of a historical document that I was reading and I decided to look it up on Ancestry to, to see if we had it and there it was. And I typed the name of one of my uh, sort of collateral ancestors by the name of Hare and found this. And I just thought it was fantastic because it went into it went into detail about the, you know, it shows that he was a confined prisoner in, at a church in Fishkill in 1776, banished to New Hampshire, six months in prison, went to New York, purchased a house, was forced to leave there, went to Quebec in August 1783 stayed one year, left with others to settle in Breton Island. Four children and wife died there. And on October the 10th, 1787, from Alexander Hare to Wolf and Stedman in London, according to this, he doesn't get his claim though, which is interesting because he ended up being the representative for loyalists in Cape Breton Island. So I don't, I don't really get that, but just a fabulous research for, a resource for you to search on ancestry for your people. And this is, this is that letter he was writing. In uh, the UEL parts one and two, this is a well-known work and it was created under the support of the Canadian government. It's a compilation of court records stemming from claims made by the loyalists 
during the Revolutionary War. And you can see by this example that this widow, Deborah Friel, has provided great detail on where her now deceased husband was born, when they settled, his military effort, when he died without a will, and who their daughter married, with how many children, and what they lost dur during the war. So another fabulous uh, resource. In Canada, land was sometimes allotted according to what regiment the Loyalists fought in. These troops went to Ontario and New Brunswick. Other Loyalists settled in Nova Scotia and Quebec. In the Loyalist era, all settlers were entitled to free grants of land. They paid nothing for the land itself, but there were admin and patent fees. And ordinary settlers, in the, in the same area, they were expected to pay fees. And you might see a half fee grant, which means the recipient was privileged as either a loyalist or the son or daughter of a loyalist or as a military claimant, which you might see MC. Now another book on ancestry is William D. Reed's The Loyalists in Ontario, The Sons and Daughters of the American Loyalists of Upper Canada. In the years following the close of the American Revolutionary War, there was a special provision that granted the children of the Loyalists who settled in Ontario eligible for free land grants, of, uh, free of fees anyways, as they came of age or married. And William Reed extracted from the Canadian Orders and Council, thousands of references to the land grants made to these sons and daughters and arranged them systematically under the names of the Loyalist parents and also supplied from additional sources, marriage dates, birth and death dates, uh, the names of the wives of the sons of the Loyalists and all that kind of thing. So definitely take a look at, at this particular book. To help pay for the American Revolution, the New York's Provincial Congress began passing laws providing for the forfeiture of Loyalist land. Find out who got the land and who lost it in this collection. Loyalists could be found guilty of treason by trial or they could be attained which uh, stripped their property rights by the state legislature and upon either forfeited their lands to the state. The state then sold the property to replenish its own coffers that were heavily depleted. This collection contains documents relating to the sale of the lands by the state, includes deeds, descriptions, and maps of properties, appraisals, and contracts of sale. Now, I love this index and it will, it's very well known and it will appeal to anyone with immigrant ancestors especially for those seeking ancestors prior to the 1820s. This important work is the best, if not the only place, for tracing relatives to early colonial America and beyond. It contains listing of nearly 5 million individuals who arrived in the United States and Canadian ports from the 1500s throughout the 1900s. And thousands of different records have been used to compile this. And so it is an index. Um, it, it could be an original passenger list that they got the information, land records, personal diaries and that kind of thing. But with any index, you have to read where that uh, collection is and then where, where they got the information. And so it could be from a book, it could be from a archival collection. So make sure you take a printout of that and go online and figure out where to find the original source. Another collection, another immigrant collection that we have is compiled from a variety of sources. It's for records between 1780 and 1906 relating to the immigrants of Canada. You're going to find the name of the immigrant and the year and the source of the original records. They're not complete transcriptions of those original records. So again, you have to go and find them and read the full, the full information. 
In 1861, this gentleman, William Caniff, and others started a historical society, and further to this, he was asked to write the history of the settlement of Upper Canada with special attention to the Bay of Quinte. He was raised in Belleville and is a grandson of loyalists. It took him five years to complete a, this huge collection, which is very interesting and has anecdotal accounts of loyalists and their struggles. The author interviewed many of the old settlers at the time who were the sons and daughters of Loyalists back in the 1860s. His notes have been transcribed online in Randy Saylor's Family and Bay of Quinty Records website that's hosted on Ancestry and Roots Web. And so uh, if he's got a wealth of information. Thank you very much, Randy. And I like to show off his uh, website because it is just so wonderful to read uh, by, you know, the extracted indexes that he's created about these people. Not all loyalists are, are listed in the old United Empire Loyalist list, or also known as the Crown Lands Department list. It includes many discharged British Army soldiers, it was originally published in 1885. The Archives of Ontario have the originals, but many are more familiar with this transcription. This list was the official register of families and individuals who had adhered to the unity of the empire and joined the royal standard in America before that treaty of separation in 1783. Another interesting book I'd like to call your attention to is the Biographical Sketches of Loyalists of the American Revolution by Lorenzo Sabine. One of the earliest attempts to collect information about prominent Tories in the New England or New York area. You might find your people there. Now I'm going to mention Quakers, and Quakers um, actually uh, founded by George Fox in the mid-17th century in England. The Religious Society of Friends, also known as Quakers, is a religious society whose members believe that a direct personal experience with God, that they, they have that. Their strict moral code that place faith above country, refusal to participate in the state church or pay tithes, and an ethic of nonviolence that forbade military service left them subject to persecution. As refugees from the American War of Independence, Quakers settled in a number of places that is uh, in around Southern Ontario, what's now known as Southern Ontario. And here they established meeting houses and schools. The Quakers did not receive loyalist status for the land because they generally didn't serve under the British cause, but abstained from that. There were some ex uh, exceptions, such as the Dorland family and a handful of others. And I'm just mentioning the Quakers because so many of them had connections to other UEL families. And what we've done on Ancestry is we partnered with the uh, with the Quaker Association and we have the meeting records for Canada and the US which are just full of information absolutely amazing collections and these are the they cut they come from Ontario for Canada but there are other provinces and a few from the US and then on the US side they have the they, we digitize the the their archives so that, that uh, are up on Ancestry now. So do check that out. Um, I, think, uh, I think, again, it's like a whole new subject, like loyalists, you need to get a good research guide. So uh, in, order to, um, in order to understand where to go, where to look, what it means and all that, you need to get a good research guide. And we've done uh, one on Ancestry that we can, you can look for all of our free research guides under our help tab and just punch in type in free research guides or research guides and see all of the different guides that we have pertaining to different subjects as well
Also, we have the Book of Negroes, which was the single most important document relating to the immigration of African Americans to Nova Scotia following the War of Independence. It provides the names of 3,000 black refugees registered on board the vessels what, where they sailed from New York to Nova Scotia between April and November 1783. The territory that became the Maritime Provinces became home to more than 30,000 loyalists. Most of coastal Nova Scotia received Loyalist settlers, as did Cape Breton and Prince Edward Island. That, at that time, it was called St. John's Island. You might want to search for any records from Nova Scotia by going to the search tab and scrolling down to the, to the map. Um, and when you find, and this is for all over the world, we have this location map. And if you click on it, it will show you all of the databases that we have for that particular area. So, of course, you could also use the, this, the catalog, but uh, I would suggest for Nova Scotia especially, uh, we do not include them in our global search due to uh, some legalities that when we, when we partnered with them way back years and years ago. Um, so the, the best place to look for Nova Scotia records is via the map. The records indicate indexed in this database relate to petitions made for grants of land and they include loyalists looking to establish a new home after the Revolutionary War. Acadians and French who found themselves British subjects, residents and settlers who had not been granted lands that they were living on. And then in quotes, black men employed in the King's service during the late war and others. New Brunswick was part of Nova Scotia until 1784, and you will find records for early New Brunswick in this database as well. And then once you fi find uh, the reference, you can um, look at the, the image at the Nova Scotia Archives website. So you see on the left-hand side there, if I wanted to look at this record, we have the index, but we will flip you over through this uh, web sort of connection and you go over to the actual archive site that has the document that you can you can look at and save onto your computer and this happens to be my william bound when it comes to the land We also have the County Deeds Registry book, and it includes the records from 1780 to 1930. Most of the records began for land in the late 1700s, which include land petitions, fiats and warrants, land grants and patents and deeds. And here is a part of a record showing the names of the people who drew lots in the city of St. John. I've just bumped it up a little bit for you. Looking for families in the census records is a must. 1821, the census of Cape Breton Island. I, I couldn't find any bounds in the list, but I kept reading through the list and they did show in the notes at the very bottom. So that was pretty, pretty uh, cool to be able to see that. In the Quebec Vital and Church Records, which are part of the Drouin Collection, you should really consult these for finding your Loyalists wherever they were in Quebec. Many Loyalists went to Quebec before they moved into Upper Canada. If you're not finding your people through the indexes, I suggest you, um, you take a look and you browse the collection on the right hand side. So if, you, or if you're not finding your people by typing your names into the boxes, go back and take a look at the location letter, the, the location, the place of worship that you're interested in, and the years that you're, you're interested in. And this particular one is for the Anglican Garrison Church. Christ Church in Sorel is another parish that's available in this collection, and it's all indexed and digitized. 
And so once you start browsing through, it's a good idea to go to the very end of the book or in the collection just to see whether the priest himself has done indexing. So if you, you know, maybe the writing was horrible and you couldn't find it through the regular ancestry search engine, you can go and browse through to the index that the priest did it as well. And then there, this is just an example of some baptisms and burials beginning in 1766. Beautiful handwriting. You don't see that all the time. The DNA, um, I wondered whether DNA would, um, would be applicable uh, just by, you know, the, the time frame that it goes back to. But uh, Ancestry DNA and Online Trees is really uh, exploded onto uh, and helping genealogists find connections through this tool. It's really just like another a tool like a census record or any other records, but it, um, it certainly can help with family history research by giving you an estimate about the ethnicity. Um, I've used it to verify my line, whether my research is correct over the years that I have been doing my research. I've expanded my tree forwards now instead of and backwards as well by connecting with my actual research uh, DNA matches. And I've broken through brick walls. A uh, lot of um, us have them. <laughs> and uh, there could be a legitimacy and or adoption in the family, unknown or known, black sheep in the family, home children. Maybe there aren't any records. Maybe, maybe you know, you're coming from uh, an area where the church burned down or the government destroyed the records, etc. And then, of course, connecting with people who share a common ancestor with you and, and that common ancestor passed down their DNA, you know, maybe they've got personal records and pictures and you can collaborate with them in order to, to um, do your research and move it, move it along. And, of course, you can, you can travel and meet them as well. So uh, I didn't have any loyalists in my family. So I reached out to my dear friend, Rick Roberts from Global Genealogy. He, he sells uh, genealogy books and materials. And I knew he had deep loyalist roots. And I asked him about his DNA results, whether he saw anything that connected him uh, to the loyalists. And he said, my loyalists, as many were, German Protestant migrants who first traveled to England and then relayed to Upper New York State on the Hudson River. The DNA results on Ancestry captures this migration through my connection to many others whose ancestors followed the same path. I knew my loyalists were from that area because of earlier traditional genealogy research. However, for someone looking for their loyalist families, origin, originating in the United States. This could be helpful regardless if they were from Upper New York State, the Carolinas, or elsewhere. What I also did was I asked a Facebook group that I had joined, and uh, Blaine Bettinger's Genetic uh, Genealogy Tips and Tricks, I enjoy that uh, Facebook page, and I asked it, it whether anybody had seen of Ancestry's new uh, newest uh, tool which is called through lines going back to their loyalist ancestor i thought maybe it was a bit too far back and one nice guy responded and shared his through lines with me he was so excited to find another researcher going back to the same ancestor that he didn't know about and he matched him on just a very small amount of dna and they had done extensive research and they provided him this is the, another way of looking at the through lines. Fifth to eighth cousin, they're sharing very small amounts. Um, and they provided him with this petition of their ancestor who was the daughter of the Christopher Lake who was named in the document. And also myself, I was so happy to find this amazing original land document from a loyalist line I was researching dated 1799 with the original seal. Something I would never have been able to find in an archives was in somebody's personal 
archives and they had shared the picture. So finally, did I ever find my four times or five times great uncle William Bound who had left for North America in that will? Well, through the Colonial Office 217 records referenced in the Nova Scotia archives, yes, I did. So I was thrilled to see his name and they noted that he was a refugee loyalist back in the 17, 1780s, 90s, that, that time period. So remember, if you need any help, you can contact Ancestry and ask a question or by email, or you can go and phone us. We're open every day. Uh, help is available for you. And in conclusion, this presentation was about resources and records that we've got on Ancestry, but there are other repositories and resources you should also look into. And I've included some of the ones I found useful in my blog posting and in the research guide. And I hope you found this webinar useful and please explore all of the loyalist related databases that we've opened up for free over the next 24 hours. This presentation will be available on our Facebook page for you to review under the video section. And I'll try to get to as many of your comments or questions. So thank you very much.